Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God that we turn to for our meditation and encouragement this morning is from the Gospel account of Luke, chapter 2, beginning with verse 25. And as we begin in, in this verse, Mary and Joseph and the young child Jesus are in the temple, having come there to fulfill what God prescribed in his law for Mary's purification. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. So far the word. In Christ Jesus, our newborn Savior and King, dear fellow redeemed, Timing can be everything. If you're playing, if you're at the plate playing baseball, it can be the difference between hitting a 95 mile per hour fastball into the seats for a home run or just a long foul ball. It can be the difference between a reception or an interception or incompletion. For comedians, it can be the difference between a joke that strikes someone as funny or not. For cooks and bakers, it can be the difference between a successful product or not. Timing can be so crucial in so many ways for so many people in so many different areas. Our God is eternal and timeless. He's not bound by time. He's not constricted by time in any way. And yet, he has perfect timing. Because that timeless and eternal God, for whom time doesn't really mean anything, deals with time for us, his creatures and his redeemed souls. And so again and again, we can find throughout scripture, history, God's perfect timing. Sometimes we're able to see how God times things so perfectly in our lives. Sometimes it's more difficult to understand. But we can be assured that God always has perfect timing. And in connection with our, the plan of salvation and our redemption, God tells us as much, as Paul wrote to the Galatians, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Those two verses in Galatians 4 really summarize and capture all of what we've been celebrating for the last week in a very simple nutshell. What happened in the fullness of that perfect time, the fullness of time God sent forth his Son, born of a woman? God, the Son of God, true God, and true man, born of the Virgin Mary. For what purpose? To redeem those under the law. How did he accomplish it? He was born of a woman, born under the law, and all of this was done so that we might receive the adoption as sons. That's what God accomplished with his perfect timing. And the text that we have before us this morning, the account of Simeon meeting Jesus, is another one of many examples of that perfect timing that God used in all things, but certainly in his plan of salvation. So this morning we consider that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. God's promise to Simeon reveals the detail in God's plan of salvation, and Simeon's blessing to God reveals the gift of that plan of salvation. Luke begins in our text by introducing us to who this Simeon is. It says, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout. He was righteous, as Abraham and Sarah were also described, Zechariah and Elizabeth, not holy, not without sin, as if they were somehow better individuals than everybody else. But he was righteous because he was a believer. For an Old Testament believer, their sins were washed away, would be washed away by the suffering of the Savior coming. Their faith was in the Savior to come. And through that faith, they received the righteousness of Christ, just as we do. They received it through faith in a Savior who was to come, 
We receive it through faith in a Savior who has come and accomplished all things. So when God describes Simeon as being righteous, he's being described as a believer who has received the righteousness of Christ through faith, even as we do. He's also described as being devout. Literally, someone who takes hold of something well and carefully. What an amazing way to describe devoutness and his faith. It isn't just an outward piety that goes through the motions and looks good on the outside. But what Simeon was living and acting and doing was from taking hold of carefully the truths of God's word. Taking hold of carefully and holding on well, embracing all that God had promised in the coming Savior and all the other truths of Scripture. And because he was the believer, righteous, and devout, holding well and carefully to these truths of Scripture, he is also described as waiting for the consolation of Israel. The consolation of Israel, as we heard at the end of our Old Testament reading, the comfort and consolation of God's people. That long-standing promise that he would, in fact, send a Savior to redeem his people from their sin. Simeon was laying hold of these promises and was looking forward to it waiting for that consolation, the fulfillment of all that God had said. And we hear that the Holy Spirit was upon him. That last part of the description provides the insight into how all of this could be. From this, as well as the rest of the context of Scripture, we know that none of us are able to believe in our Savior. None of us are able to lay hold onto those promises. And none of us are able to wait expectantly in faith for the fulfillment of Jesus' return For Simeon, his first coming, none of that is possible without the Holy Spirit. As God says, without faith, it's impossible to please God, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We need the faith, but we can't bring it or do it on our own. The Holy Spirit alone can provide it. We think of the Holy Spirit most frequently as being poured out on Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, which he was. But this is an example of the Holy Spirit being active and involved in creating faith and building up believers long before Pentecost. We ought not relegate the Holy Spirit's activity only to post-Pentecost. That outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost was to equip the New Testament church for the spreading of the gospel now that salvation was complete. But the Holy Spirit was never inactive before that. He's always been active bringing faith into the hearts of hardened sinners, such as we are all by nature. To this man, righteous, devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, blessed by the gift of the Holy Spirit, God had given a promise, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Because of that promise that he would not die until he had seen the Savior, Simeon is often portrayed as an old man, as on the bulletin cover this morning, and also in the hymn that we just sang, the aged seer. There's no mention of his age in Scripture. We cannot say definitively that he was old or young. He was simply given the promise that whatever the time would be from when God made that promise to when the Savior would come, Simeon knew he would see in his own, with his own eyes that fulfillment of God's promise and the birth of the Savior. Here is this man, uniquely fitted for this time to be in the temple at that time when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus into the temple so that he could see him and declare the blessing that he would speak out loud in the second part of our text. Why him? Why then? Why that? You can ask that question all the way through. Why the shepherds? Why not somebody else? Why the wise men as the first Gentiles to see the Savior? Why Mary? Why Joseph? Would there have been other people that God could have chosen? Undoubtedly. And Jesus, in fact, said that Elijah could have gone to any other number of widows in Israel, but God chose to send him to the widow of Zarephath to accomplish his purposes. This is all part of that big picture that God carefully chooses the individuals with whom he has given certain gifts to be in the certain place at a certain time to accomplish his purposes all in the fullness of time to bring forth his goal of saving sinners. It starts to make your head swim just a little when you realize how many pieces and parts God has put into place, but it also reveals to us the remarkable ability of God to manage all of this, to plan all of this, And your salvation was not haphazard. 
Your salvation was not just an off-the-cuff idea going by the seat of his pants. From eternity, God planned your salvation. And in time, all the way to the fullness of time, detail by detail by detail, to person to person to person, to testimony to testimony, to prophecy to prophecy, every piece and part, all working together to accomplish the salvation of sinners in that fullness of time. It is an amazing glimpse into all that God has done and continues to do for us. It only heightens our amazement at this salvation and our understanding of the depth of, the, of His love. He did all of this for you. And though we may not always understand or see every purpose that God has for every detail, there is no coincidence in any of that. All planned, all according to his will. That also gives us great encouragement in our lives. While we are not key players in the actual fulfillment of the prophecy to bring salvation, in the same way that Mary and Joseph and, so and Simeon were, yet we are still part of God's overarching plan of salvation. God's will is that sinners be saved. He has called us to faith for that purpose, to bring us that life and salvation. And then he has further called us to go and make disciples of all nations, to preach the gospel to every creature. We are part of that integral plan of salvation, bringing sinners to salvation and then sending them out to share the good news. That means that as we go forward, we can be confident that God is leading us to be in the place of, the, of his choosing to accomplish the work that he lays before us. Parents praying and waiting for children and then blessed with them, it's God's perfect timing. People who are ill, waiting for help, medication, healing, whatever the need might be, it is in God's hands for his perfect timing. We would always choose to have someone have a happier, fuller life longer, someone that we love, but when God strikes them or allows them to be stricken with sickness and allows them to die, bringing a time of grace to an end, it is God's perfect timing. Every piece and part of everything that we experience in this life, everything personally as well as what affects us from an outside source, all is used by God, he says, for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. He is a God of detail, of planning, and he is effective. In the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son and the promise of Simeon, to Simeon, and having him there at that time in the temple to declare God's praises is just one more piece to testify to God's faithfulness and that overall blessed plan of his grace. In what Simeon said, he blessed God, he reveals that plan of salvation and its blessing all the more. We hear that he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon took Jesus up in his arms and blessed God and said. Another very wonderful picture image in the words that Luke uses. Simeon picked up Jesus and put him in his arms, literally in the curve of his arms. This isn't holding Jesus out. It's holding him, cradling him in that perfect spot for a baby. And not just like a grandfather would do, although that's part of it, but Simeon, a believer, cradling, holding in his arms God's faithfulness. Simeon cradling, holding in his arms the living, breathing proof that God had fulfilled his word, in general, to the salvation of sinners, but also to Simeon that he wouldn't die until this very thing happened. And in that joy of that moment, in the, in the celebration of what he was experiencing, Simeon said, Lord, now you are letting your servant, literally your bond servant, Depart in peace according to your word. Right there we see the insight into God's salvation. Simeon viewed himself as a bondservant to the Lord. Nothing on his own, but a servant to the Lord and to his grace. And he was now departing according to God's word. He had been faithful. My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. We may at times take for granted the truth that Jesus came to die for the sins of all people, sometimes because it's so prevalent in Scripture and we hear it so often. Perhaps sometimes we 
even forget it in the sense of 